Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> well, first of all, can everyone hear, uh, hear me? <laughs> How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Uh, Council, Mayor, thank you for having us. Um, for the record, Martin Cha, Project Manager with FCS, and with me is Sky Jang, uh, Senior Analyst um, with FCS. Uh, tonight, we'd like to present the results of our ambulance utility rate study update for the city. Um, and Sarah, thank you very much for uh, flipping the slides for us. Slide two, please. Thank you, Sarah. In terms of our scope of work, uh, we're asked to do a couple of things. Number one is to update the ambulance utility rates. Uh, and the uh, cost recovery objective for this is 100% cost recovery. Uh, for uh, council and uh, members of the listening public, uh, what this is, is um, uh, in Washington state law, uh, cities are allowed to assess an ambulance utility rate uh, to pay for ambulance utility services within, um, uh, within a uh, municipal jurisdiction. Uh, and the reason for this is if the jurisdiction finds that uh, private services are inadequate, the city uh, can establish a, an ambulance utility to provide that function. And that's what you have here. Uh, FCS provided or prepared the previous study, which was in 2017. Uh, and of course, we're coming back now for a uh, update to this. What I'd like to share with you tonight are the uh, key assumptions as part of the study. <clears throat> uh, go through the uh, updated rates uh, and uh, share with you the five uh, scenarios that uh, we prepared for the city. Um, just in a nutshell, uh, we have five scenarios. The first one is a baseline scenario. In other words, we would finance the current levels of service for the city uh, with, um, uh, with services as, uh, as we have now. Uh, the second scenario is to uh, augment the current level of service with uh, four additional staff. Um, and of those four, three would be funded through a, uh, a safer grant. Um, and that's a three-year grant. We'll go Go into a little bit more details on that in a second. Uh, scenarios, um, scenario number three is uh, similar to scenario number two, but without the safer grant. Um, scenario number four is a baseline plus seven uh, new FTEs, and then scenario number five is uh, baseline services plus nine additional FTEs. Thank you, Sarah. So to set uh, uh, council members to uh, provide context for the study, uh, it's important to take a look at what's happening in terms of number of responses and um, incidents within the city. So let's go through this table. Uh, the first row shows the number of incidents, uh, the, again this is where, uh, response inc incidents between 2019 and 2021. And as you can see, uh, we have about 24, that, oh, 2,430 incidents in 2019, and that's increased to about 2,900 in 2021. Uh, the average response time has also increased during that same period from about six minutes to um, about seven, uh, just over seven minutes in 2021. Uh, 2020 was obviously a COVID year. Um, the response time there was seven point, uh, uh, almost 7.4 minutes. In terms of the number of responses, uh, the, uh, for that statistic, we see that the number of responses has grown also. Uh, with the increase in the number of incidents from about 2,610 in 2019 uh, to about 3,365 in 2021. Uh, common metric uh, to, uh, to use to evaluate uh, responses is to evaluate that based upon the number of responses per uh, 1,000 population. And as you can see, in 2019, there were 401 responses. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, per 1,000 uh, city population, and that's increased to uh, just under 500, or 483 in 2021. <coughs> um, as part of our forecast, uh, what, we're, what we do here, council members, is we take the, um, uh, the uh, current cost of your ambulance utility, and we escalate that over time. And uh, what we then do is, with that escalated cost, is to assess that um, against uh, 
the current rates, the current ambulance utility rates, and to assess its uh, the current sufficiency uh, or the sufficiency of existing rates to pay for those uh, those costs. Uh, we'll take a look at several metrics here. Uh, general inflation of 2.25%, and this is based upon the 10-year um, uh, long-term long-term average. Uh, we all know what's been happening with inflation, especially nationally. Uh, it, uh, that's been widely reported in the news. Um, and in the current year, in um, 2021, 20, uh, I think uh, uh, inflation has been running about 6 to 7 percent, uh, but the long-term average is expected to run about uh, two and a half to three percent. Um, I recently took a look at forecasts by the Philadelphia Reserve, <clears throat> and that's what um, that's what they're forecasting, and that's consistent with uh, economists within the state of Washington what they're forecasting. Uh, labor cost inflation, we're forecasting that at uh, three percent per year. Uh, benefit cost inflation at about three point two percent per year. Um, and population growth at about um, 1.7% and then customer growth, uh, about 2%. Uh, new FTEs, uh, so there are about three, ne three new FTEs that we've included in our financial forecast. Uh, one is a firefighter paramedic starting in 2021. Uh, there is a firefighter EMT starting in 2022 and a assistant uh, fire chief uh, starting in 2022 as well. Next slide, sir. Well, what this slide shows is a comparison of our original study back in 2017 and forecast the expenses to 2022. Uh, those are the, <coughs> excuse me, the first and third columns. <coughs> excuse me. And the middle column shows the forecast or forecast expenses for 2022 based upon our uh, current study. And what we see here is an increase in costs of, uh, between um, the previous study of 3.5 million in 2022 versus the current study at about 4.9 million. Um, the increase in costs are due to several factors. Number one, the additional staff uh, that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, as well as the, um, as well as the uh, cost for the uh, new station that, um, that was mentioned earlier. Next slide, sir. Uh, when we take a look at the um, uh, cost per incident, uh, this is one, another way of looking at uh, the financial performance of your utility. On the left side, we break down the cost between availability and demand. Um, and the reason why we break this uh, between those two categories, council, council members, is under state law, uh, with an ambulance utility, uh, there are two components to your costs. Uh, one is what's called an availability cost, and the second component is called a demand cost. Uh, the availability cost uh, generally includes expenses such as uh, dispatch, uh, labor, uh, training, uh, supplies, and equipment. Uh, basically, the expenses that's required to uh, have your uh, fire department ready to serve. The demand costs basically represents uh, that portion of your costs that's uh, uh, related to responding to um, uh, incidents. And that includes uh, uh, things such as the uh, uh, frequency of calls as well as uh, travel time to, a, uh, uh, to an incident. Uh, that cost structure that you see there between availability and demand, the, uh, the ratio between those two is uh, is pretty common, and that's uh, what we see in other, with other cities as well. On the right side, uh, we see a breakdown of the revenues uh, that would come in to uh, pay for your ambulance utility costs. This includes several things. Uh, number one, uh, starting on the very bottom, uh, transport fees. Uh, these would be fees that would be uh, paid for by, um, uh, by private insurance. Uh, the second um, uh, segment, the uh, miscellaneous revenues and grants, uh, that represents uh, interest earnings, for example, as well as grant revenues. Uh, rate revenues, um, you can see, uh, makes up a portion of that. Uh, GEMT, uh, that uh, stands for Ground Emergency Management um, 
and I forget what the P stands for. Um, uh, transport, thank you. Um, and though that represents uh, revenues that reimbursed from the state of Washington for costs of transporting um, residents <coughs> to the local hospital that is not covered by, um, by Medicare. Uh, the top segment, EMS levy, uh, this is the portion that uh, residents pay as part of the um, their property taxes for the EMS levy. And then the very top portion is the portion that uh, represents your shortfall uh, between current revenues um, and the uh, and the cost of um, and the cost of service. Uh, next slide, sir. On slide seven, what we have here is a forecast of expenses between 2022 through 2027. Uh, there are two side-by-side um, uh, -side bars here. Uh, the left one uh, represents the forecasted expenses. Um, the expenses in 2022, excuse me, is forecasted to begin at 4.3 million, and that grows, as you can see, gradually up to about 4.7 million by the year 2027. Again, based upon those uh, inflation factors that we about three slides ago. Um, on the right side are the uh, revenues. Um, the uh, green portion represents your operating revenues. Um, and again, this is a uh, composite of uh, all the revenues that we uh, reviewed in the previous slide. And then um, there is a, a small purple portion, and this represents the out of uh, city uh, subsidy. Um, so when we respond to incidents, if there's a call that goes outside of the city, uh, there's a portion uh, of that that benefits another city and they are uh, obligated to reimburse the city for those expenses. The clear portion represents the uh, shortfall between revenues and expenses. And as you can see, that shortfall begins at about 700000 in 2022, and that increases over time to just over a uh, million dollars in 2027. Uh, so when you add up uh, those um, uh, that clear portion over the next uh, several years, that adds up to about 5.2 million um, over the study period. And that's the gap that we're trying to cover as part of the study. Next slide, Sarah. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we, we evaluated five different options. Um, again, the baseline option is to adjust rates to uh, maintain the current levels of service. Uh, as uh, you know, the department currently has 20 FTEs, um, and that includes um, 20 line firefighters. Uh, and included with that figure are also the um, new staff that I had um, discussed earlier, the um, paramedic, the, fire, um, the EMT, as well as the assistant fire chief. <clears throat> For scenario number two, this would be, um, again, as I mentioned earlier, augmenting the baseline level of service with uh, four FTEs, uh, three of whom uh, would be funded by a three-year SAFER grant. Now, of course, that SAFER grant um, expires at the end of three years, and we'll talk about what that means in terms of um, a great impact uh, for, uh, for the city. Uh, we were also asked to prepare uh, three additional scenarios, which was a baseline plus four um, without a uh, safer grant, a baseline plus seven, and a baseline plus uh, nine. Um, the, uh, there are two asterisks, as you can see, uh, next to the 29 FTEs uh, uh, on the very far right, and that uh, would be our recommendation in terms of uh, the additional number of uh, staffing that would be required to address the uh, um, the uh, workload or the increased number of incidents and responses that, um, that we've seen within the city. Uh, Sarah, next slide, please. So let's start off with the very first row. Um, this represents your current monthly rate for your energy utility, and that's just over $19, or $19.03. Um, across the top, we have the five scenarios, starting with uh, scenario number one, 
the baseline. Uh, scenario number two is the baseline plus the four with um, uh, three staff funded from the SAFER grant. Uh, scenario number three would be the baseline plus four. Scenario number four, baseline plus seven. And then the very last column, uh, baseline plus uh, nine additional staff. Let's focus on the very first column, the big, uh, scenario number one, or baseline. Um, under our um, forecast, the rate uh, that we needed in 2022, uh, again, to fund a current levels of service would be an increase from 1903 to uh, $23.64. Um, part of the reason for that increase is um, a, uh, a one-time uh, code grant that we uh, received, and that expires in uh, 2022. And that's uh, one of the reasons why uh, you see that increase there. And then from 2022, Going forward through 2027, uh, that rate of 2364 increases to uh, 2508 in 2023, uh, then 2527, 2545, and then to about $25.83 uh, by the end of the forecast period. <clears throat> on scenario, let's talk about scenarios numbers two and three uh, together on this table. Uh, so under this uh, schedule, what we see here is, um, let's start with scenario number three, uh, baseline plus four. This is the one with the Super Grant. Um, the rates, uh, the, the adjusted rates for 2022 would apply under the scenario, uh, but starting in 2023, uh, the rate would need to, need to increase to $30.62. And that compares to the 2022 rate of 23.64. Um, again, that's, uh, that does not include a SAFER grant. Um, if we introduce the uh, benefits of the SAFER grant, again, this, um, the proceeds from the grant would fund three FTEs, three core FTEs. Uh, the city is able to buy down that rate, uh, down to 26 29 uh, starting in 2023, and that would increase to uh, 26 66 by the year 2025. And then with the expiration of that SAFER grant, uh, the rate would um, increase to 31 17 in the year 2026. And that compares to a rate of $30.97 under, under scenario three, which excludes the uh, safer grant. <clears throat> uh, the rates for scenarios numbers four and five, as you can see, are commensurately higher. Um, in 2023, uh, the rates for scenarios numbers four and five would need to be $34.70 and $37.20, uh, respectively. And again, over time, as um, uh, the uh, cost of doing this increases, uh, those rates would need to increase under scenario four to about $35.46 by uh, 2027. And then under scenario number five, uh, would increase up to $38.09 by the year uh, 2027. Um, so what we've prepared for you council here are really the bookends of, of, um, uh, of the choices that we believe are available. And scenario number one uh, would be the uh, bookend representing current level, levels of service. And then scenario number five would be, um, I'll say, the uh, upper bookend uh, with uh, current levels of service plus uh, nine additional activities. So this time, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, stop our presentation. This is actually our last slide. Um, so we prepared five scenarios for you. Um, baseline, which is the current level of service, uh, plus four alternatives. Um, and again, what I'd like to do now is, um, is stop our presentation and entertain any questions um, that the council may have for either myself or Scott. Thank you, Martin. Um, and so we have Martin here that can answer the questions of the actual uh, study. We have Angie uh, that uh, also worked with it, and we also have a fire chief. So with that, Rich, you got a question? Thank you for putting this together for us. I have a question about uh, page five to uh, compare page five to or slide five to slide seven. I'm just looking at 22 forecast expenses and at the bottom under current study results for 2022 it's 4.8 million. Are you seeing that slide? Excuse 
Yes, so Councilman, um, I think your question is on slide five. We have a total cost of uh, 4.88 million. Right? And then on slide number seven, um, in point point two, the cost is 4.3 million. Uh, the, the difference there is um, the uh, EMS uh, versus the um, BLS uh, calls for service. So for, uh, what we show in slide seven would be the cost of your uh, BLS program. So if we go to slide seven and it's at four point three. Yes. But in footnotes it's talking about we got seven hundred and fifty thousand added in there uh, for South Fire Station. So if we wanted to say we haven't done anything with the South Fire Station, would that really be three point five five million rather than four point three million on that uh, twenty two cost? It would uh, reduce it by about three, about uh, half of that, so about three hundred thousand. So the seven hundred fifty thousand company is the total cost of the station, but it's a um, fifty-fifty between the fire, uh, between the bureau, um, ambulance utility, and the general. Thank you. Catherine. So um, I want to look at slide six and ask if this if if your projections include the um reset ems levy and the um the added amount with all of the new homes uh, that we have in this area in the last uh, couple of years so the levy reset last year or this year right angie this year yeah I will say that the data that we provided does have the updated levy information as well as a current um, count of utilities so it's all up to date Eric so I'm just wondering um, Mike about how many positions are open at the moment two or three Currently, right now, we have the position that council had voted for for a paramedic firefighter. We have the promotion of Captain Ritter to assistant chief to open another position. And unfortunately, I just lost a paramedic firefighter to Lacey Fire because he lives in that area. It was 10 minutes from work, and he chose to go that direction. So currently, I have three positions I'm trying to fill as it is. Right, and, and it's I know it's a little difficult to fill those positions. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if we, you know, in adding new positions, because that money that we're not spending obviously has to be earmarked for those positions, but as it goes into, you know, 23 and, you know, two positions still aren't filled and you have one, um, how does that impact this study? I don't believe it's going to impact much at all. Our, our goal is is to replace those right. individuals right. as soon as possible. I, I agree. I mean, you know, just from my personal experience, I, I had a little fire down at the resort last week, and I was pretty surprised when the ladder truck showed up, which was good. I'm glad it did, and two guys got out of that ladder truck. And I went, really? That's up? You know, so um, it, it, it's a tough situation, and I know you guys need, so I'm, I'm you know, supporting giving it, I just, you know, I know it's hard to, to fill those positions, so I don't know if you go a year, how does that impact things? You have to remember, too, that those open positions mean that we're accruing more overtime. So this, right. the cost savings right. with the salaries are kind yeah. of offset by the, the time and a half for the overtime. It's kind of like the police exactly. understaffed using the sheriff and having to pay all that, so it kind of washes out. Yeah. Catherine? Uh, all in my turn. I just had an odd question. So on scenario uh, five, um, baseline plus nine additional, how realistic is that if, if to put to think that we could fill nine spots? Do you think it would be difficult, Chief, or? I do believe it's going to be difficult, but it's needed. I mean, from the way I've seen today and throughout the last two years, we are shorthanded. This is the recommendation of what the utility rate study is recommending. 
is still, you know, like nine more additional peace people on board. I'm there every day, just about. I see it. These guys, they are working their tail off. Um, if we can do it, it'd be fabulous. If these guys need a break, it's a safety issue. Um, I know we talked about um, the, us having, um, you know, the ability to have a urgent care here. Um, I know we've been having discussions about our RFA possibly coming down the pipe. Those all take time. We're a long ways away from these things. We need to start planning now and start working for the future and not keep waiting. Thank you. Yeah, I just have questions. If we uh, got an ambulance service in here, that would uh, free up a lot of firemen, wouldn't it? I think we've done down this path before, looking at private ambulances. Um, I think you need to look at the cost of what a private ambulance is going to be to the city to have them out here. You don't, you don't need to be freeing up two individuals. We, there's a number of times we're running double calls all day today. There's been zero people in the fire department other than Brian and myself um, and our fire inspector because the four guys that are on shift, which is a minimum staffing, they've been run back and forth to the hospital. And that's been going on for almost two days straight. They've been shorthanded. I'm not saying you don't need some more firemen, but fire uh, ambulance service seems like that would free up some more people to stay in town. And I really wish that the uh, city would look at that. On that, we're looking at uh, seventy-six dollars and eighteen cents per billing cycle on a scenario uh, five, which is what's recommended, and that's a pretty big hit for the public. And that's before. You guys are going to be going into contract negotiations here down the road, and so I'm assuming these numbers are low right now, and they'll be higher once uh, you get a uh, contract settled with the fireman. My recommendation would be to look back. I believe this has been looked at once before, and I believe it might be even in the uh, council minutes from the past what that cost would be for an ambulance. Martin? Yes, uh, thanks, Mayor. <clears throat> so, Councilman, just to answer that question about the ambulance, uh, the ambu private ambulance utility service, excuse me, uh, we recently completed a study for the city of Olympia, um, and we're presently um, conducting a study for the city of Tomwater. And those two studies, Councilman, are looking at um, moving, actually moving away from the private ambulance service and creating a city owned um, uh, BLS program. Or ambulance program, and the reason why is uh, for those two cities, they've seen a gradual degradation in service uh, for their ambulance services. So what's been happening for both uh, Olympia as well as Sunwater is they've seen um, that over time, the availability of their private ambulance services has um, the availability has actually increased, uh, and that's what that has resulted in is um, either increase on-site time for their EMS units as they're waiting for the uh, private ambulance service, in this case uh, AMR, uh, to show up on the scene, um, or the um, EMS unit would actually be the ones transporting the um, patient to the local hospital. So in that period, the uh, EMS unit will be taken out of service, obviously, because they're, they're treating that patient and, tra and uh, transporting that patient to the, um, to the local hospital. <coughs> Okay, I, I guess um, what I'm familiar with is King County. They got Medic One, fire department to do a great job. They show up, they stabilize the person, and uh, the ambulance service comes in and takes them to the hospital, and that frees up the firemen to go back to the station. That's a pretty common practice in King County. I really like to see us uh, get something going like that here in our town, so that uh, even if it's only two firemen, you know, Mike, um, we've had firemen not in town when we've had fires, so two is better than nothing. But I'm not saying you don't need to increase your staff. Yes, ma'am. So um, I have two questions. The, the first one is, can you tell us the difference between uh, what an incident is? And this is slide three. Number of incidents is uh, 2,913. 
number of responses is 3,365. That's 450 some difference. What, what is the difference between an incident, incident and a response? Well, thank you for that question. Um, so an incident is, for example, if, I'm, if I uh, call 911 and, and call for service, uh, that call is considered one, one incident. Um, but if some um, two units show to, to, to uh, serve me, then those, um, those two units coming out would count as two responses. So then at 452, that means that uh, at least that many incidents had more than one rig show up. Is that what we, is that what that's telling us? That's correct. And then um, my second question is uh, probably, I don't know if it's for Angie or John, um, what is the likelihood of us getting another safer grant? I think we were turned down last year, um, and it's, it's not something that uh, a lot of these, they don't grow on trees, my understanding. It's fairly difficult to get. So what is the likelihood of even having that possibility? I'll turn over to to Mike. We we we've had a lot of discussion because it, obviously there's two options with it. That's why that we put one with safety program, one with that. But Mike, well, we have a very slim chance. We're going to take the chance. I mean, we have to take the chance to get there. Um, the reality is, uh, we're not the only ones in this situation. All throughout the uh, United States, throughout the nation. Everyone's looking for that money source and for that extra help. And so we're competing about against just about every fire career fire department out there. The only thing I can say is that the service and took every possible lesson learned in that last grant cycle to make our grant application as strong as possible. But to speak to the chief's basic comments, it's 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 highly, highly competitive. So and then and I just want to remind everybody who's sitting here thinking about this. We're talking about if if this were to go through with scenario five, doubling the rate over five years. Frank? I don't know if this is for you, Mayor, or for Angie, but what uh, caused our shortfall in our fire fund? Martin already kind of hit on that. We've been adding positions. We've added three new positions, and we haven't added any funding to fund them. We've also renegotiated wages. Um, we have the South Station in there. So it's just, we haven't done anything since 2017, but the costs have just gone up continuously. So when the costs go up like that, there should be rate adjustments to offset them, but we haven't done any. So now we're where we are. I have a question, maybe for um, the consultant. And my understanding, and, and, and it's very limited at best, but about private ambulance, ambulance service, is it also depends upon the market that that ambulance service serves. And if they can't make money because you don't have a higher paying clientele or you can't balance it out, it is a deterrent. I believe also for pri looking at private ambulance service. Is that a fair statement? Uh, yes, someone. that's a fair statement. Thank you. Catherine? So I want to put something else on the table here. Um, there's nothing that stops us from changing the amount of funding we give, we provide for EMS from the general fund. So right now we're doing 15%. There's nothing to stop us from increasing that to 20%. We have to look at priorities. We understand that in the budget. But rather than put it all on the backs of the ratepayers, maybe coming through the general fund, which has been running a healthy surplus, is something we ought to really seriously consider. Frank? Well, I'll say I agree with that. Catherine on that, but uh, I don't know how King County does it, but uh, 
they seem to have a pretty efficient operation with the uh, ambulance service. And I really think that we should uh, spend the time to visit, revisit that. It's, it's been a while since it's been brought up. Um, you know, we're talking a heck of a raise for people on their bills here. So let's have some consideration for what, how we can save some money. And sure. uh, I'm all for looking into bringing in a private ambulance service, but I do remember I brought up a a couple of things that I remembered when we did it last time. It, the two things that happened was it was really expensive and we didn't have the volume that would make money for them. So maybe that's changed and I'm more than willing to take a look at it and if we can get somebody in here for a price, but I'm not optimistic or confident that we can. And also on your thing and raising the amount out of the general fund, and yes, we've been pretty flush the last few years, but we're already coming into a point where we're not going to be, you know, so... We got into the problem of funding the fire department out of the general fund, which was eating up a huge amount of it. That was the whole point of doing the EMS rate in the first place, um, what, six six years ago or so? And so now if we start going back to the general fund to fund it, we're going to be two, three, four years down the road in the same place that they're still going to have to raise the EMS rate. I would rather, you know, look at what's the best for the city overall and not what we're going to do this year and kick it down the road so four years the council's at the point of well now we're right in the same boat of having to do a huge rate increase Frank. i just want to comment on that um we've got a lot more homes in there since the last time you what you're talking about i mean there's hundreds of more homes so we've got a lot more revenue coming in so i'm, I'm going to ask what well, let's try to do what we can to help the citizens you know so we need to take a look at it Rich, question for the consultant again. Uh, slide number six, you have at the top monthly cost per incident of $168.20. With your uh, experience dealing with all different cities and municipalities, how do we rate in our average cost per incident? Are we higher or lower, right at the same amount? That's a good question, uh, Councilman. I need to get back to you on that. Um, so I just want to make a quick comment, Frank, that I agree we need to help the citizens. There's 7,000 citizens in this town, and again, just last week, the ladder truck showed up with two people in it. Um, you know, so if we're helping everybody, we need to make sure that that person, because there's two ambulances out, there's nobody there, house fire or something else happens, we have the staff to take care of that. That's also taking care of the citizens too. Not, you know, so I, I agree, I don't want to burden people with more money than they can afford, but we want to have a medium to make sure we're taking care of everybody. And that means having the services that a lot of people need to take care of them. Yeah, I'm asking that we look at it. Okay? Yeah, and, and, and so I'm that's all. And, I'm, I'm to do that. and I still think the ambulance service, we need to look at that. Yeah, and I would, I would say, Looking at this, it, it's a hard it's a hard number. I mean, and I totally agree. And it's going to be a hard discussion that you, as a council, will have to make the decision of what you need to do um, because it's it's cost and it's service. Um, we will have plenty more conversations with it. Uh, I have no problem of. Uh, I know that uh, we can have we can reach out to the private ambulance service of what what that looks like. Uh, we've had just a really brief conversation about a regional fire district, but that is way down the road. I mean, there's just a lot of things that have to go, plus you have to get the support of not just social shores, but other, other things in there. So I, as mayor, that I'm open for, for bringing to you whatever resources we can to see what we need to do, and that's why this rate study is so important that I wanted to get it out as soon as we got it so you guys can think about it. Angie? And I would say, too, that with, when you're looking at slide nine, I mean, jump into scenario five, is, it's a lot. Um, but there's nothing that says we can't do a rate resolution by year. So instead of going from 20 to 29, you know, we could do scenario two if we get the safer grant, then grow it to... You know, scenario four in three years. So 
we can write our rate resolution however we want to to kind of develop a staffing and funding plan for the department which is something we didn't do last time which is again why we're behind so i mean we don't have to just jump to 29 it, and we should, probably shouldn't because it's just too much at once chief doesn't even think he can hire that many but maybe having some kind of five-year plan that's reflected um, we have to use this study to um, support our rates so I'm just something to think about that it's it's not all or nothing we can, we can do it incrementally and actually have a plan that does it you know little by little instead of one huge jump at a time so just a thought council any more questions for martin martin thank you very much and you left us with a lot to think about Okay, moving on, we, are, we have no uh, staff report, uh, so then we go to, um, are you the what, why don't we do the liaison reports and then we'll